Hi, my name is Vivita and I was born in Kuwait. It's a small country at the head of the Persian Gulf. It borders with Iraq on one side and uh, Saudi Arabia on the other side. Even though you're born there, you don't become a citizen. I don't consider myself a Kuwaiti because my parents are Indians and they only landed in Kuwait because my dad had a job there and we lived there as a migrant population in Kuwait. A migrant population doesn't have rights to vote in Kuwait uh, and only recently they had, after the Gulf War, a democratic party where elections are held and people can vote. It was all the royal family and their people who had any rights as such. I studied in Kuwait in an Indian board school. Uh, it was run by a missionary called the Sisters of Carmelite. They're, they're India-based and so we had kind of like an Indian education, learning about Indian history and everything. But because Kuwait didn't have many English medium schools in the country, a lot of other nationalities also studied there along with Indians. So I had friends from Hungary, Palestine, Iraqi students as well uh, who wanted to study in an English medium school. And so it was, it was kind of like a mini global school. But when I was age 10, I was visiting my grandmom in her village in Mangalore. And uh, that was when Iraq invaded Kuwait. Because of the invasion, we couldn't go back. And uh, we had no communication at all with Kuwait. I mean, we didn't know whether my dad was alive or whether anyone was alive or what was happening, how, what was happening to the people. We, we got a letter finally when the Indian foreign minister visited Kuwait. He explained that everything is quite okay. They are, they are getting food from Iraq because uh, the airport was closed and Kuwait didn't have its own agriculture or anything. It's a desert. Everything, including you know, rice, beef, bread, everything is imported into the country. So once Iraq invaded Kuwait, all the ports, all the airports were all closed. So they only could get what Iraq was sending them. And then he was finally evacuated through the Indian government. They evacuated more than 100,000 immigrants, Indian immigrants from Iraq and Kuwait. Incidentally, Air India entered the Guinness Book of World Records uh, for evacuating the most number of people by a civil airline. Living with my grandmom in South India, it's a small village called Barkur in the, in the district of Mangalore. It's a very, very picturesque place. We're, we're not very rich. It's an agricultural-based income. I grew up in a city and a desert, so all this lush greenery and everything was just fantastic to me. I met my husband in college while I was doing my bachelor's in engineering. I mean, he had a very similar childhood as mine in the sense that um, his family also moved out of India uh, when he was small. His dad got a job in Nigeria first. And I remember his granddad telling me that when they wished his dad goodbye, they, they never thought they'd see him again because at that time everyone thought that Africa was this big jungle with wild animals and no one thought, I mean, and flying was such a big thing in those days and yeah, there was no internet and no one knew what kind of civilization was there in Nigeria and they just thought that this was the last time they were going to see him and um, well, Nigeria was a good experience for them and then they moved to Libya where he got a better job but unfortunately they had to leave Libya suddenly again because of the Lockerbie bombings and because the sanctions imposed on the country made it difficult for common citizens to live over there. During our engineering, uh, both me and my husband, we got jobs in these big IT companies of Bangalore. They sent us sometimes on work to other countries and I, both me and my husband, we got a chance to go to America. And I worked in a town near New York, but unfortunately he wasn't anywhere. He was in a different company and his company sent him to Chicago. So we didn't really like staying there apart. So we came back from America pretty soon and then I got a posting in UK. And this time he didn't get a job in the UK. 
So I didn't like it that we were both in different countries now. It's bad enough in the same country, you're not in the same city. So then after that, I went back very quickly. I stayed here for only two months and I went back. But then within four months of me going back to India, we realized he got accepted into Oxford. And so he came back to the UK. And uh, while, while he was studying his last term in Oxford, he got a job in this great company in London. And so even though we wanted to go back to India after his uh, master's was completed, this was too good an opportunity to let go. And so then we had to move to London. My husband got a tier one visa, which is sponsored by his company, so that he's able to work here in the UK. And I get a dependent visa, a dependent partner visa that is eligible to work in the UK. But unfortunately, employers are very wary of employing people with dependent visas because they're not sure what will happen to the person once their spouse work is over. Not many companies would like to hire people on dependent visas. But I enjoyed London because it has so many things to see. I mean, even though I'm not working, I don't get bored in London because I, I know if I was in America, and I wasn't working, I would be really, really bored because it's not, it's not as culturally as vibrant as London. But I wasted almost a year of my life in London initially because I had got an illness as soon as I came here. And, well, the NHS took so long to diagnose what it was. And they didn't, eventually they didn't even diagnose it. And... Uh, after my parents came here, they told me, uh, well, they were very upset to see me so ill. They said, you have to come back to India and check with a doctor in India. And an Indian doctor, in two days I was cured. I mean, I felt like such an idiot staying here and hoping NHS could do something when I could have gone back to India and done it in two days. So, yeah, that was, that was one of the things I don't like about London is that even though it's so developed in all aspects, they really don't... Uh, have that much of a grasp on a person's health as such, which I think is the most important thing a country should do first and foremost is to make sure that citizens have good health. Another problem I face is I used to work in IT in India and that same kind of job is mostly done in India right now. It's not done in London, it's all offshore. So for me, it's quite difficult to get a job in what I'm experienced in because all that work is done in India now. So I have to learn something new or I have to uh, just switch over to something completely different to what is done in London. Uh, for my husband, that's not such a difficult thing because he also works in finance and London is the financial capital of the world. Most of the people with my background in India would find it easy uh, to move around the world because an IT job would take you at least for a couple of months to the actual company site. Even though the work is offshore, you have to go to the company at least once to understand their business and their processes and then you can do the work offshore. So most people with an engineering background generally do go abroad. But saying that it's not in India, it's a huge country with a huge population. So not even 2% of people would be, you know, that well off to be able to uh, do an engineering degree and then work with a big IT company. I don't feel immigrants come and take away any person's job as such. It's, it's all based on merit. So if a person's qualified and good enough to do a job, it shouldn't matter from where the person's coming. It should just be that this person is the best suited to do this job and that should be the reason why someone hires a person. And I don't think there's a need for anyone to be afraid of immigrants because there's a very good story I can tell you which it was uh, which is told in India actually about the Parsi community coming to India. The Parsis are migrants from Iran. They came many, many centuries back to India and the local king over there told the Parsi ship that was approaching. Um, there's no space for you. There's no. Uh, there's no. Uh, there's no things that we can do for you, and they can't communicate. So he just sends them a cup full of milk, filled right up to the brim, and he sends it back to the ship, saying, "There's no space. We're full to the brim." And then the ship they send it back mixed with sugar, 
dissolved in it and they say we won't take any space that we won't fit in only we'll make the milk sweeter in the process so i mean that's a way of saying what migrants can do to a country they won't they won't take any extra space or destroy anything and just enrich the place i feel everyone i know has been in a similar situation they've worked somewhere they've traveled gone on holiday and well it's it's not i've not found it extraordinary to do something like that but i find it surprising that british citizens even though they don't have visa restrictions and they're free to travel to almost any country in the world they don't actually travel they're quite safe in their small place and uh, i guess they're they just don't understand that there's a bigger wider world that they have to see and explore and understand even though i have said that my background is quite normal because india has more than 1 billion people and a majority of them are still poor still working lands uh, farming so for a lot of them it's just a struggle day after day after day but i was very lucky that i was born in a middle class family we didn't have to worry about the next meal so we could actually think about okay what career we would want to pursue what profession we would want to pursue and we were free to choose what we wanted to do whereas a lot of indian families they don't have that choice and if it was open borders it would be much easier for people to just go the moment they are able to another place and probably get a better life the, the thing is most people first have to have that money to travel and then go through all this red tape of moving through one country to another so that 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 i feel is completely unnecessary because if a person is qualified if a person can do a job if a person can just just have a better life in another place they should not be denied that i mean there's just there just doesn't there just hasn't to be a reason for someone to be in one place because they were born in that place they they should be able to go wherever the life will be happier so i really support open borders and uh no visa restrictions and people freely moving from one place to another if they can get a better life